Hey everyone! So today we are going to talk about pollution because that's not depressing. Um, this is going to be our last lecture in the theme of um, uh, agriculture and urban land use. Um, so we're going to sort of end it on a not so great note, but that's okay because we're going to uh, talk about all this when I get back and we were going to move forward um, and look at economic geography, which may also be just as depressing. But let's move on. So, as we noted in the last lecture, there are different kinds of pollution. Um, let's sort of take a look at water pollution first. Um, the reason that water pollution is such a big, uh, big problem and such a big deal um, is because it's widespread, and the reason that it is widespread is because it is very, very easy to be very um, direct in your in your pollution. Like basically, you just dump something in the ocean, and ta-da, there you go. Um, it is very, very easy to dump waste into a river or the ocean, and then just completely ruin stuff. Um, that is why water pollution is so widespread, and it's also why it's kind of hard to contain. Um, so let's have a look at what is actually being affected here. Um, where the water is? Right here. So out of all of the water that exists on the earth, 97.5% of it is in the oceans. Um, and then only 2.5% of the water that we have on the planet is fresh. Um, of that fresh water, 79% of that is actually located in our ice caps and glaciers. 20% um, of that is groundwater. And then only 1% of that is easily accessible surface freshwater. Only 1%. Of which, 52% of that are lakes. 38% um, of that is just m the moisture that is inherent in the soil. And then the other percentages include atmospheric water vapor, water within living organisms. So, you know, if we're like at least 70% water, right, humans? Um, then I guess that sort of helps uh, make up the makeup of all the fresh water on Earth is the water that exists within us. Um, but that's only 1%. And then rivers also have 1%. So really, it is a fraction of a fraction of a fraction um, the water that we have available to us to use and be able to drink and be able to properly water our crops. So that is why water pollution is such a huge, huge issue um, that we always need to keep in mind. So where does it all come from? Um, there are point sources and there are things called non-point sources. Point sources are those that um, have a more direct impact. It's literally um, a direct line between pollutant and pollution. There are three main point sources. So um, basically industries that actually use water, um, those sorts, such as the um, the processing of heavy metals, and then eventually, you know, those heavy metal byproducts end up in the water. Or these heavy metals end up damaging infants and fetuses, uh, municipal sewage, which is awesome, and agriculture, so basically like irrigation. All of these things, as you can see here, if there are point sources, that basically means that they are sort of like have a direct line to our waterways. The pollution is going directly into it. It is a direct line between source and waterway. On the other hand, we have what are known as non-point sources, which is sort of like more kind of indirect sources. They have to follow a few steps in order to get into the actual water. Um, mainly what we're looking at in this case is urban runoff, which is um, includes things like oil, uh, antifreeze from your car, um, detergents, the things that you use to maybe wash your car, um, and uh, things like lawn fertilizers, uh, fertilizers or pesticides or herbicides that you might be using in your own gardens at home. Um, basically what happens is all of these things are kind of basically, like pretend that you know they're sort of like on the surface of the earth, they're on the streets, they're on our lawns, and then when it rains, um, 
then all of that stuff sort of gets washed into our waterways. And that is what is known as a non-point source because it's more of an indirect thing. If you were to dump oil like directly, <laughs> like if you were just to pour your motor oil directly into the ocean, that would be a point source. But because this has to, this is sort of on the surface of the earth and then only through things like, um, like rain um, or other kinds of precipitation washing it down, then it sort of reaches things through a more indirect method. Um, it causes things like this, especially in the case of um, lawn fertilizers, it causes a phenomenon known as cultural eutrophication. That's how you pronounce that. U eutrophication, because you've done this to the earth. Cultural eutrophication. Um, the reason that it's called cultural eutrophication um, is kind of the reason why we have, um, I think it was in our last lecture, where we had a division between uh, natural and anthropogenic uh, sources of, oh, like for example, like the greenhouse effect. There is a natural greenhouse effect, which is awesome, and it causes us to basically be here and has the, the earth toasty enough for us and animals to live in, but then there's anthropogenic um, uh, sort of causes of all of this stuff, which means that it's more culture generated, it's more human generated, basically. So cultural eutrophication First, let's explain what eutrophication is. So you see all this green stuff here in the water? Ew, gross. Basically, this is um, algae. Um, this is algae. This is basically plant life that is kind of growing on the surface of the water. Now, this stuff happens naturally, but cultural eutrophication happens when it is basically from these man-made sources like lawn fertilizers. So one of the big things that lawn fertilizers have in order to nourish the earth are things like uh, like nitrogen um, in order to, you know, something that plants really, really like, I guess. And the thing is, fertilizers are things that plants like, right? So plants like this stuff. This stuff helps plants grow. And it's good when you're, like, watering your awesome azaleas or your heirloom tomatoes, but not so much when it's interacting with plant life here, um, which basically once you sort of feed this plant life, then this is what it ends up doing to our waterways because they become rich in all of these nutrients that were meant for your particular plants, but unfortunately, um, this plant life likes it a little bit too much. And that is what's known as cultural eutrophication. And that is a side effect of um, urban storm runoff. So let's basically take a look at uh, some place that's really, really close to home, the Everglades. Um, the Everglades is a is kind of a local uh, hot issue. Um, one of the issues um, about the Everglades in general is the idea that we're kind of little by little kind of pushing that line uh, between civilization and the Everglades and like little by little we're sort of like inching just a little bit more a little bit more as our population grows we need room to expand and unfortunately you know that's sort of like kind of dipping into the Everglades a little bit and even though the Everglades are somewhat protected um, you know we still are at risk of losing it um, and especially when these sort of side effects of civilization are things like this. So a pump station delivering uh, dirty water to the Everglades or um, sugarcane fields, which is something that we grow. Sugarcane is... Oh, wait. What kind of a crop is sugarcane? <gasps> Whoever said plantation crop, you are awesome, officially. Well done. It is a plantation crop. And... As we know, plantation crops are grown in mostly tropical humid climates, so there you go. Um, and so sugarcane is grown here. Unfortunately, if you remember the video um, where we were looking at how cane sugar was made, you notice that there was a one sort of part of that video where you sort of had this, um, this big sort of like watery, there's a lot of water involved in the production of sugarcane, um, and the discharge of that, um, 
ends up in the Everglades and whatever sort of chemicals from the from the um, sugar processing process um, still remain in that water do end up um, potentially in in our waterways and harming the Everglades. So if we look um, here on the left, we have the flow of the Everglades, um, and basically you have here our fancy lake. What lake is this? Perfect. Good old Okeechobee. And this is how you have, historically, this is basically where the Everglades have kind of flowed out of. Basically, the Everglades kind of ran stuff, you know? Miami was literally swamp. Miami was literally Everglades. Basically, all of South Florida was basically Everglades before we came in and ruined it. Um, so this is how the Everglades flowed historically. Nowadays, this is what we have left, which is not very much. And what you can sort of see now is um, how it is that the water from Lake Okeechobee is being diverted uh, to service all of the different populations that we have here. Um, let's sort of like zoom in a little bit more and look at just how much um, our water has been diverted um, over the last like 100 years or so. So starting off, this is about all of the civilization that we had to work with and this is about all the water that we needed in order to service it. Um, basically major canals kind of diverting water from Lake Okeechobee in order to service our new burgeoning population here in South Florida. Um, in 1920, we see more connections to uh, like direct lines to the coast. Um, we move all the way out west um, as of 1930. Um, and in 1950, you see more of this sort of like grid pattern happening um, and it just keeps on expanding. Um, and basically what it means is that, you know, as we become more and more reliant on this lake, we become so dependent on it, um, that, you know, like every year, um, you know, especially that, you know, there've been some years in the past where we've had enough of a drought, um, where, you know, we've had to monitor Lake Okeechobee's levels to make sure that things could be, um, sustainable for all of South Florida, especially, um, with this population that we have, you know, I remember, I remember years where, um, you weren't allowed to water your lawn on, on certain days and times, um, in order to kind of conserve water, um, in, in other places, uh, like in California, um, or other places like near the Southwest, sometimes drought situations are bad enough that people just aren't allowed to, um, water their lawns at all, and they've turned to using, um, which, you know, is sort of good locally, um, they're, they've turned to using more sort of local, like, desert plants that literally don't need as much water, so instead of, like, lush green lawns, um, they basically have just a bunch of, like, cactus and other succulents, um, that don't need a lot of water as part of their landscaping. Um, another interesting thing that they've turned to is some people really, really like a green lawn, but they might not be able to water their lawns enough in order to support that. So what they end up doing is they have these um, basically painting companies, like a regular good old fashioned painting company that will come and paint your house. They've gotten into the business of painting your lawn green. <laughs> so that you don't have to water it anymore and you can just still have a green lawn it's just painted on which is hilarious um but then also kind of raises the question of what happens if it does rain and if any of those paints would contribute to cultural eutrophication so it's interesting in theory um and, and, and such is capitalism that, that new industries pop up from even the most dire situations. But uh, there you go. Kind of interesting ways of looking at that. So what are the impacts of water pollution? First, as we mentioned when we were looking at our oceans and forests, water becomes oxygen starved. Um, what is it called? Well, first off, what is the official name 
like the official fancy name for low oxygen levels in the water. The like official fancy name? Yes, hypoxia. Hypoxia is the official fancy name. And then the sort of colloquial way of calling those areas with low oxygen levels, those are Yep, those are dead zones. Um, so, water pollution causes dead zones. Also, as you mentioned before, cultural eutrophication. Fertilizers from farms, not just, you know, the stuff that you spray on, um, but from actual, you know, major agricultural operations. Those fertilizers can cause excessive aquatic plant production, so eutrophication. And they also have an impact on us as humans. So human diseases um, are also a huge, huge side effect. And considering that a significant amount of the world's population doesn't have access to a lot of this fresh water, we need to keep it clean. Um, and unfortunately, folks do not necessarily have access to a lot of that drinking water um, or, or a way to sort of cleanse the drinking water. So they are subject to... Um, these impacts in the form of diseases. So, where might some of this come from? From the agricultural industry. And especially uh, things that are known as animal feeding operations, or AFOs. Uh, an animal feeding operation, or an AFO, is an agricultural operation where livestock are kept and raised in confinement. So rather than the extensive farming uh, that goes uh, that goes on in like the outer rings <laughs> right of von Thunen's rings um, in those outer rings they have enough space where animals can kind of roam free um, much like that cattle ranch in Fort Pierce that we saw in that video but here um, these this would happen closer to an urban center where there's not enough uh, where there's not a lot of space you basically like instead of the cattle roaming and grazing at their leisure. Basically, these these animals are brought up in pens and, and the food is brought to them. Um, now, what happens, you know, th think about that last slide when we were talking about um, uh, aquaculture and the side effects of aquaculture and the idea that having uh, so many fish in a confined area, like in a fish farm, uh, will cause like an excess of their waste to pollute the surrounding water. Same thing on land. So every year, a 1,400 pound lactating cow, right? Because this isn't just uh, regular livestock for beef, but this is also the dairy industry is, is at fault for this too. Um, a 1,400 pound lactating cow produces 70 pounds of milk a day. That's a lot of milk. And this is what comes out of said cow. 300 pounds of nitrogen, 45 pounds of phosphorus, and 165 pounds of potassium. Uh, a lot of times comes from the poop. And that is one cow every year. So multiply that by hundreds of cows huddled really really close together and so when you think about the 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 urban runoff potential the non-point source potential of that that's that doesn't sound too good for 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 the for the health of our waterways if you will literally cow poop now another thing that ends up affecting our our waterways negatively in terms of agriculture is not um, just animal feeding operations, but the literal uh, taking away of water from a water source. So this is the Aral Sea. Um, it is located in the former Soviet Union. I believe it is in between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, which I believe you have identified so lovingly in your Central Asia map. Um, and this is a sea, but it's not much of a sea anymore. This is how it used to look in 1989. This is what it looks like today. It is basically mostly dried up. 
Um, and the reason for that is during the time period where all of these areas were um, under the control of the Soviet Union, this sea was used as a source of irrigation. So basically you kept taking water out, kept taking water out, kept taking water out, and not replenishing it. And so the sea literally dries up. So you have these things, um, these things that were once islands, uh, especially this one. This area here was once an island that then became... Um, a peninsula, which then became just straight up part of the mainland uh, over the years. There are efforts in place to try to restore it, but um, because of government management and you know funky relations and the idea that uh, this straddles uh, two uh, two borders, right? Um, basically, this is this is a territorial dispute. This is a uh, this is a resource dispute as well because of because of the water. So that is causing issues in trying to organize ways in which we can help restore the Aral Sea. So this is how it works. There's only like small patches of water left. It's almost kind of comical to even call it a sea anymore. It's more like, hey, it's a pond. <laughs> it used to be a sea, but now it's not. Um... That brings us to the other sort of side effects of all of this, um, all of these like both point and non-point sources of pollution, especially when you consider um, uh, our our cow friends, uh, Steve, <laughs> Steve and Robert, and and their poop, um, and the sort of runoff potential of of their poop, uh, basically ending up in our water. Right? These are the things that can happen. Cholera, typhoid, hepatitis, dysentery, E. coli, and all of these waterborne diseases are the cause of just about half of all of the deaths of children in the developing world. 4.6 million deaths among children and adults. 4 billion cases of diarrhea, or Montezuma's Revenge, every year, and 80% of all the illnesses in the developing world. And there are about, walking around, there at any one time, there are probably 1 billion cases of illness. Um, specifically, waterborne illness at any one time. Um, when you were looking at... Uh, potentially like how deadly like sharks were, right? We were talking about our forests and oceans. Um, there are a few things, uh, there are plenty of things that are deadlier than sharks. Uh, one of them is the mosquito. And then if we're just talking organisms in general, these would probably be up there with mosquitoes as probably the most deadly organisms on earth just because of that. Don't need to worry about sharks. This is way scarier. Especially one of these diseases, which is actually my favorite, which is really weird to say that I have a favorite disease, but uh, it's called enterobiasis, which is just sounds pleasant. Um, it causes a failure to gain weight, which is, for some of you, might sound actually relatively tragic. It's like, ooh, I gotta get me some of that. Except, this is how it ends up. So first it starts where you take in the eggs via unclean water ends up in your belly. The larvae that you've ingested in the water hatches in your small intestine. And as it passes through, it grows. And it grows to this lovely sort of worm-like form. And then it gravitates to your perianal folds. So basically, it just kind of goes to your butt and lays eggs in your butt. And then they hatch there, which causes a significant amount of unpleasantness uh, in your nether regions. We need clean drinking water is basically is basically the moral of that story. Make sure that your water is clean and it would be wonderful if we could get access uh, to clean drinking water in the developing world especially so that they're not subject to stuff like this because this just sounds awful. So that's our water. <laughs> now let's turn to land pollution. Now what is the biggest uh, contributor to land pollution? 
product packaging. Um, basically the boxes of all the stuff you get. Think about like all of the boxes of cereal you've opened, like every electronic device you've ever had that has come in a box, like everything that you've ever purchased has come in a box, everything that you've ever like ordered from Amazon that comes shipped in a box and then whatever you bought has a box um, and then you just chuck that box away. Um, that product packaging uh, is responsible for half of the solid waste in America, um, in American landfills. It's just boxes. Um, the other half of, of product packaging is either recycled, hooray, or incinerated, burned up, which is, you know, okay, so it doesn't fill up our landfills, but um, by burning it, you are then sort of putting um, more air pollution up there. So, you know... You win some, you lose some in that case. Um, basically, what kind of like personal contribution do you have to it? Um, you personally, probably, um, on average, contribute about four pounds of solid waste uh, every day. Every day. Um, these are things like, uh, like, like the packaging of the food you eat, uh, the boxes you open, uh, water bottles, um, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, things that you just sort of take for granted every day, you are producing all of this solid waste. Um, recycling? Decent option. Um, so, recycling helps. Um, now, it helps in particular in the U.S. because uh, paper products are the largest part of U.S. solid waste, followed by food and yard waste. So, paper products are good because they are probably the most recyclable and you probably see the most sort of like return on your recycling investment in terms of uh, limiting the amount of solid waste you have. Now that brings us to what do we do with all of this solid waste that we're producing because it's not going any, anywhere anytime soon. Um, you know, we're, we, you know, we keep producing products, they keep getting put in boxes, um, you know, unfortunately, perhaps in response to some of the stuff that I said about our water supply, um, we might be buying more bottled water, but unfortunately that just causes more solid waste in the form of plastic bottles, right? So all of this has to go somewhere. Um, and basically these sort of byproducts of, of our industry end up leaving extensive pollution behind, um, which includes toxic pollutants, uh, toxic wastes in particular. Um, what are toxic wastes and what makes up toxic wastes? Uh, heavy metals, uh, PCB oils. Now, what are PCB oils? PCBs stand for... Uh, PCBs stand for polychlorinated biphenyls. Um, you don't need to write that down. Just know that they're PCBs. Um, uh, polychlorinated biphenyls and what they were used for is as a uh, cooling liquids um, in a lot of manufacturing operations so if things are being like uh, cut or ground um, the process of cutting something or grinding something using a big um, like a big grinder or a big cutting wheel that generates a lot of friction which generates a lot of heat um, which could potentially, you know, damage uh, whatever operation. So usually they will use some sort of like cooling fluid during the process, and those are usually PCB oils. Fortunately, um, they th these things are highly toxic, um, and in fact, uh, they cause cancer in animals and are probable human carcinogens. Uh, so they are banned. They were banned in 1979, um, but unfortunately, you know probably a little bit too late for a lot of people. Uh, so heavy metals, PCB oils, cyanides, um, strong solvents, and acids, uh, a lot of byproducts of our industrial revolution um, end up being toxic. Um, now, how do you get rid of these things? One of the ways that that we could sort of think of, because what are you going to do? Dump it in the ocean? No, that's an issue. What are you going to do? Burn it? No, that's probably a really bad idea. So maybe they say, well, let's just 
put it underground. Let's bury it like really, really deep and hope that that doesn't do much of anything. Except when it does. And when it leaks. As in the case of the lovely city that is not so lovely, Love Canal, New York. Um, uh, Love Canal, New York, so named because there was a guy named Love that wanted to build a canal uh, between uh, these two river sources um, in order to connect them. Uh, the canal itself was built but never used uh, completely. Um, and it was used as a uh, as a burial site. Uh, a huge chunk of it was used as a burial site for the toxic waste from a nearby company called Hooker Chemical Company. Um, and it was this huge patch of land was used as a toxic waste dump, and then they sort of covered it, and then grass grew over it. And if you were to look at it back in the day, like in the early 50s, um, then you wouldn't have noticed anything wrong with it. And that area was rapidly expanding in population, so... Uh, there was a school that wanted to use this particular patch of land uh, in order to build on and in order to, uh, basically in order to expand uh, the city and give people a place to live and a place to go to school. And the chemical company, I believe, sold it. Uh, I don't think they wanted to sell it at all because they knew what was under there. Um, and it's not like nobody knew what was under there. Uh, but, you know, there was sort of this, like, hey, you'll be fine kind of attitude attached to it. Um, but they sold it, I believe they sold it to the school for a dollar. Basically, like, I think in the contract there was a caveat that said, okay, we're going to sell this to you for a dollar. Like, practically give it to you because the school was so insistent in getting this land. It's like, sure, fine, we'll give it to you. Uh, but just know... <laughs> <laughs> laundry list of things, a laundry list of potential issues. And sure enough, the toxic uh, waste started leaking. Um, in some cases, it was, you know, it was even like pushing up into like people's backyards. Um, high incidences of cancer. Um, children that were being born were being born with like ridiculous uh, birth defects. Um, there was a huge incidence of um, miscarriages. So, you know, there were a lot of miscarriages. And then even if the fetus um, was was born at full term, it did not end up going well for a lot of people. Um, this, is, this is here in the U.S., right? So, you know, we could talk about, like, you know, causes of pollution and issues that are happening in the developing world. But, hey, you know... You know, and, and sometimes we think, not in my backyard, right? Uh, it's actually a term. It's like NIMBY, uh, N-I-M-B-Y, uh, not in my backyard, which means it's like, hey, well, you know, as long as it's not near me, I don't care about it. Um, as long as I don't have to deal with it, I don't have to see it, it's out of sight, it's out of mind, it's not in my backyard, so who cares? But that kind of attitude is what gets a lot of people seriously hurt. Uh, so this is the end of the lecture, but what I want you to do is I want you to go to this YouTube page, um, and it's like a 12-minute video, but it's going to explain Love Canal to you in further depth because it is probably one of the worst uh, environmental disasters to happen in the U.S. next to... Uh, Three Mile Island, <laughs> which we'll get into when we get back, but it's probably one of the worst, if not the worst, environmental disasters uh, to happen in the history of the U.S., so it's worth a look, um, and it's worth knowing the history and worth knowing just how drastic uh, some of this stuff can get. So when we get back, we will discuss a lot of these issues. I'm sure you have so many questions for me, um, and I can't wait to hear them all, uh, but for now, watch this video. Fill out your map, make sure that your study guide is all well and good for Monday and Tuesday for the next time I see you, and have a good weekend. And don't pollute anything. <laughs>